Hello, and welcome to the new podcast of Math is 400 Mathematics and Economic Modeling. Today, we're going to introduce the concepts of an infimum and a supremum of a set of real numbers. We're going to define what these things are. Then we're going to use a prove a theorem that gives an equivalent definition of a supremum and infimum. And then we're going to use this new definition in order to show that some class of sequences have a limit. So let's go to the whiteboard. So let's uh, start by defining the notions of a supremum and infimum. So first of all, we have to start uh, from a set S. And here we take S to be a subset of R, right? So it's a subset of real numbers. So uh, the fact that S is a subset of R is important here. Okay, so it's a subset of numbers and we say that the set S is bounded bounded from above when when this is bounded from above well it's bounded from above if we can find the number z in r okay such that for all elements in s all elements x and s x is lower or equal to z okay so if we take the real number line we have to find a number z, for example, this one here, this is z, and then we need that for all elements in s, x is lower or equal to z. Okay, so the set s lies to the left of this z. So, for example, elements in s can be here, it can also contain some interval of elements, okay, of numbers. But it's impossible that uh, there's an element in S that's on the on the right of Z. Okay, so it can include Z itself. That's possible, but it should not go beyond uh, Z. Okay, so I think it's intuitive, right? There's a bond, a bound on S from above, right? There's something that's bigger than any element in uh, S. And then, of course, we have a, an analogous definition. We say that S is bounded from below okay when is s bounded from below below well if there exists a number z in r such that for all x and s z is smaller or equal to x okay so there's a number which is below any element in s and here important with these def definitions is that z is in r right both times so it doesn't have to be in the set s itself right it can be something outside the set it just has to be below or it has to be above everything here okay so now you're ready to state the definition of a <clears throat> before <laughs> before we state the definition of a supremum if such an element exists right if there's a z that's greater or equal to any element in x then we say that z right this z is called an upper bound on S, right? Any element that's greater or equal to any element in S is an upper bound, right? So here, S has many upper bounds. Z is an upper bound, this is an upper bound, this is an upper bound, this is an upper bound, right? Even this, if, okay, so if S is all these black things, then all these things are upper bounds, okay? Similarly here, if Z is an element such that for all x and s z is lower or equal to x then uh, z is a lower bound on s okay so let me give an example for example if s is equal to the interval one two okay then for example Three is an upper bound okay four is an upper bound five is an upper bound any things like here two is also an upper bound right so it's greater or equal to any element in this interval uh 2.1 is an upper bound and so on and so on right so there are many upper bounds you can say so here one is a lower bound okay uh, zero is a lower bound minus one is lower bound and so on and so on minus 1.1 is a lower bound so you have also many lower bounds let's that it's lower than 
any element in this uh, interval. So with S is, for example, uh, the set R, right? This is also a subset of R. Well, in this case, S is not bounded from above, right? There's no number in R that's greater or equal to any number in R. S is also not bounded from below, right? There's no element in R that's lower or equal to any element in R. So here R is not bounded. Okay, so it has no upper bound and it has no lower bound. If you, for example, take S to be the numbers N, Okay, so this is one, two, three, four, and so on. Remember the whole natural numbers. Then here, n, this is not bounded from above, right? So there's no number that's greater or equal to any number in, in this set. However, s is bounded from below. Okay, so in order to show that it's bounded from below, the only thing that you need to show is to give a lower bound. So for example, zero is a lower bound on n. Okay, there's no, every number in n is uh, greater or equal to zero. Okay, so try to get familiarize yourself with these notions. Uh, bounded from above, which means that there exists an upper bound. Bounded from below, which means that there exists a lower bound. The set can be bounded from above, but not from below and vice versa. Uh, so you should be able to give some examples, or if I give you a set, you should be fairly intuitively to, uh, for you to say whether it's bounded from above, from below, and so on. Okay. So why do we need this? Well, we need in order to define a supremum and an infimum. So let S, let S be a subset of R, and assume that it's bounded from above. Okay, so if it's bounded from above, then you know there's at least an upper bound. There's at least one upper bound. However, we can be more precise and we know, or we, if, if S is bounded from above, then what do we know? We know that there is the smallest upper bound. on s okay and this is this number this is called the supreme of s okay likewise if s is bounded from below okay then you know there's a lower bound however what we also know is that there's a greatest or largest lower bound on S, and this largest lower bound is called the infimum. Okay. So to summarize, what's the supremum? The supremum of S, well, it has to satisfy two conditions. First of all, it has to be an upper bound. Okay. And then two, it has to be the lowest upper bound. Okay, so for example, if y, the number y, is the supremum of s, then if z is an upper bound on s, what do we know? Well, y is the supremum, so it's the lowest upper bound. So we know that y is smaller or equal to z. Okay. Why is an upper bound with it below the any other upper bound, less than or equal to any other upper bound? Okay, and then you have something similar. If y is the infimum, then you know that it has to satisfy two conditions, right? So it's a lower bound, and two, it's the greatest lower bound. Okay. So if z is a lower bound and y is the infimum, then you know that z is smaller or equal to y. Okay, so that's the definition of a supremum and infimum.
So what's important to notice, one first thing that's important to notice is that the supremum and infimum exist uh, if and only if S is bounded, right? So the supremum exists whenever S is bounded from above and the infimum exists whenever S is bounded from below. So if S is not bounded from above, right, you know that there's no upper bound, so there also cannot be any supremum. Likewise, if S is not bounded from below, right, so there's no smallest number in S, then there's no lower bound, so there can also be no infimum. Okay. So these are necessary and sufficient conditions to have a, an upper or a lower bound. So let me give you an example. If S is equal to 0, 1, we know that this is bounded from above, right? Two, for example, 2 is an upper bound. It's greater or equal to any element in this interval. So what's the smallest number greater or equal to any number in this interval? Well, in this case, uh, the supremum of S will be equal to 1, right? It's an upper bound, and it's the smallest upper bound that you can find. The infimum of S here will be equal to 0. It's a lower bound, right? Anything in S is greater or equal to 0. And if you take any other upper bound, then 0 is greater or equal to this other upper bound. <clears throat> okay, so for this example, it's pretty easy. So let's, for example, consider the interval 0, 1, right? So here, this doesn't include 1. Okay, it's the half open interval 0, 1. So in this case, the infimum of F S is still 0, right? It's similar to here. So what's the supremum? The supremum, you have to look at all the upper bounds and take the smallest one. And here, the supremum will also be equal to 1, right? So if you I take a number that's greater or equal to any number between 0 and 1, excluding 1, I imagine all these numbers that are greater or equal to this, and I take the lowest one, then I will have the number 1. Okay. So here we see supremum of S, who should here, right, does not need to be in S. Okay. So in some cases, the supremum is not part of the set S itself. In some cases, it is. In other cases, it is not. Okay. So this is important uh, to notice. Let me give another example. For example, S is the numbers 1 over N, and here N go over all the natural numbers, right? So if I enumerate the set, if n is equal to 1, I have the number 1. If n is equal to 2, I have the number 1 half. I have the one num number 1 over 3, 1 over 4, and so on and so on. Okay, so first question in order to get the supremum, is the set bounded from above? Well, yes, for example, the number 2 is greater or equal to any number here in this list. Okay. So if I look at all the upper bounds, what's the lowest upper bound? Well, here in this case, it will be 1. Okay. It's equal to this first number, but 1 is greater or equal to any other number in this list also. So 1 is here the supremum. What's the infimum? Well, first of all, you have to ask yourself, is this... Uh, bounded from below the set, well, you can see that nothing can become negative, right? So all these numbers are greater or equal to zero. So for example, minus one, minus two, minus 100, these are all lower bounds on the set. So what's the greatest lower bound? Well, you can see that all these numbers, it will go to zero, right? So zero is lower or equal to any number. And for anything strictly above zero, you can get something smaller here in the set. So here the infimum will be equal to zero. Okay, so if I draw this on the number line, you have zero, one. So the first number is one, then you have one half, then you have one over three, then you have one over four, then one over five, one over six, one over seven, and so on and so on. So zero will not be in this list, right? But it's the greatest lower bound. Okay, good. So these are the definitions of a supremum and infimum. And an important thing to notice is that uh, you're not going to show the existence of the supremum and infimum. In fact, the existence of this sub and inf is 
once s is bounded, this follows from the definition of the real number line. All right, so it's basically a very, in a, it's an important properties of the real numbers that these things exist. Okay. Good. So once you have s, once s is bounded from above, you can always find a supremum, right? This thing exists. Once s is bounded from below, we always have a infimum. This also always exists. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to give an equivalent definition of a supremum and an infimum. So this is going to be the first result. So we have that let S be bounded from above. Okay. So we have the following results. So Y is the supremum of S if and only if. Okay, so this is an if and only if statement. Two conditions are satisfied. So first, the first condition is that Y is an upper bound. on S. So this is not very interesting. The second one is more interesting. The second one says that for all epsilon strictly positive, there should exist an X and S such that X plus epsilon is greater than Y. <clears throat> so equivalently, X is greater than Y minus epsilon, right? So th these two things are the same, right? You just put epsilon to the other side of the inequality. Okay, so that's uh, the results. So let me, it's always good to draw a picture of what exactly this means. Okay, so we have the real number line. So we have some subset S of these numbers. Okay, and then we have a Y. Okay, so Y is a supremum. Okay. So what do we know about this y? When is y the supremum? Well, two things have to be satisfied. So y is an upper bound on s, which means that s lies to the left of the y, right? Entire s is below y. And then second, for any epsilon that I can draw, okay, so let's pick an epsilon, uh, a value. I can find an x in the set such that this inequality is satisfied. Okay, so what do we have here on the on the right hand side? We have y minus epsilon. So what's y minus epsilon? So for example, if this is my epsilon that I have chosen, this would be y minus epsilon. So for any epsilon that I can pick, I can find an x such that x is bigger than this number. Okay, so for example, I can find an x and S that's in this interval. And I can do this for every epsilon. Okay, so if I take epsilon arbitrarily small, then Y minus epsilon will go to Y, but still I can find a number in S that satisfies this inequality. Okay, so whatever epsilon I go below my supremum, I can still find something between Y and Y minus epsilon. This is, this is the main gist of this uh, theorem. And then you have this, then you have that y is exactly equal to the supremum. This is the theorem from for a supremum. Of course, I can do something similar for the infimum. So y is the infimum if and only if y is a lower bound on S. And then for all epsilon, there exists an x such that, and now I just have to reverse the inequality. Okay. X is smaller than y plus epsilon. So if I draw the line here, you have the real number line. I have my y somewhere here. Okay, so I know that my entire set s, y will be a lower bound, so my, my entire set s will be to the right. And for every epsilon, if I put y plus epsilon, then I know there's an x um, that's below y plus epsilon, so there should be some x here and s. 
okay and this also any epsilon so I can take epsilon arbitrarily close to y I can still find something in s that's that's in here okay so what we're going to do we're going to prove this uh, prove this results so this is an if and only if condition okay so what do we have we have an if then condition and an if then condition from here to here okay so let's first go from the left to the right so what do we know we know that y is a supremum of s and then you have to show that this is true and that this is uh, true okay so what we're going to do we're going uh, to start here then show a and then show b okay so let's assume that y is the supremum of s so it's also good always good to say what you need to show right you need to show well, we need to show that y is an upper bound okay and then you have to show that uh, for all epsilon bigger than zero there exists an x and s such that x is bigger than y minus epsilon okay so what we're going to do we're going to show it for the uh, supremum and then the infimum will be very similar so i will leave this as leave this as an exercise uh, for you okay so we're going to show a and we're going to show b so first of all if a, y is the supremum of s what what's exactly the supremum well we just go back to this definition right supremum means that it's an upper bound and it's the lowest upper bound okay so from this what we know we know that y is an upper bound on s and y is the lowest upper bound okay and we need to show a and we need to show b well let's see immediately from we know that y is a supremum okay so it implies both of these well from this we immediately see that this is satisfied okay because they're exactly the same okay so if y is an upper bound from s then a is proven okay so this is very easy this first part is just uh, follows uh, from the definition of a supremum okay so we still need to show b so what are we going to do we're going to use the proof by contradiction to show b okay so we need to show that this implies this okay so what are we going to show uh, do we're going to use the proof by contradiction so we're going to assume that this is true and this is false okay because we have p implies q p implies q if we negate this then we assume that p is true and q is false so we're going to assume this uh, is true and this is false okay so if we write it down write it out completely so we're going to assume the following we're going to assume that y is an upper bound on s we're going to assume that y is the lowest upper bound and then we're going to assume that this is false right so negative q so what's negative q well we have to negate this okay so what happens if we negate this expression well we have to change the for all into an existential bigger than zero the existential into for all so for all x and s and then you have to negate this premises which means that x is lower or equal to y minus epsilon so what's here here it says that there exists an epsilon bigger than zero such that for all x and s x is smaller than y minus epsilon so what does it mean that for all x and s 
x is smaller than y minus epsilon. Well, this means that y minus epsilon is an upper bound for s. You see, for all elements in s, x is smaller than y minus epsilon, so this has to be an upper bound. Okay, so this follows from this. However, let me number this one, two, and three. The two y is the smallest upper bound. Okay, so we have that y minus epsilon is an upper bound, but y is the smallest upper bound. So y is smaller than y, smaller or equal to y minus epsilon, which is clearly impossible, right? So y cannot be smaller than y minus something strictly positive. Okay, so this is uh, an easy argument to show that uh, this, this implies this. Okay, so it's an uh, easy proof by contradiction. Good. So this is one direction. Now let's go to direction from here to here. So what do we know? We, we have that y is an upper bound. So this is a, b. We know that for all epsilon bigger than zero. No, we know <laughs> that there exists. Uh, let me repeat again. We know that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an x and s such that x is bigger than y minus epsilon. Right? So this is the side here, and we have to show that. Okay, let me restore my camera. We need to show that. Uh, y is equal to the supremum of s. Okay, so y is an upper bound for all epsilon that exists in x such that x is bigger than y minus epsilon, and we need to show that y is the supremum of s. So in order to show that y is the supremum of s, well, we just look at the definition of the supremum, what this entails. Well, we know that this entails that y is an upper bound On S, and then we need to show that Y is the lowest upper bound. Okay. So to summarize, we need to show that this implies this. Okay, so let's start by showing, let me call this big A and this big B. So small a and small b implies big A and big B. So if a is an upper bound, well, then we know that it's an upper bound, okay? Because this is these two things are just equivalent. Okay, so showing a, this is follows, a follows from a, so this is very easy. <clears throat> so we only need to show b, okay? We need to show that small a and small b imply big B. And again, we're going to use a proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction. To show B. Okay, so again, this is a P implies Q. So proof by contradiction negate P implies Q. Negating P implies Q means P and not Q. So we assume that y is an upper bound. We assume that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a number x and s, such that x is bigger than y minus epsilon. And then we assume negative, negative q, right? So we negate this, which is y is not the lowest upper bound. 
okay so these are the three things that you assume and we want to find the contradiction so what happens if y is not the lowest upper bound well because s is bounded from above uh, there's a supremum right so if y is not the lowest upper bound there's an upper bound that's lower than y okay so from 3 it follows that there is an upper bound lower than y so let's call this upper bound that's lower than y let's call this z so let z be an upper bound of s such that y is smaller than z uh sorry there's an upper bound lower than y so z is smaller than y okay so let me draw the picture to uh, make it more clear so we have a y we have a z okay and we know that z is an upper bound of s so my s is entirely to the left of z what do we also know we know that for every epsilon there exists an x such that x is bigger than y minus epsilon okay so for every epsilon below y i can find an x between <coughs> y minus epsilon and y and in addition everything is below z so if i pick my epsilon smart enough i will get a contradiction okay so for example if i pick my epsilon here and here i have my y minus epsilon here point two says that i should find an x that's greater than y minus epsilon okay so i should find an x that's somewhere here Okay, but at the same time, everything in S, so also including X, should be below Z. Okay, so this will give me my contradiction. So let's try to write this down. So what do I need? I need an epsilon that's smaller than the difference between Y and Z. Okay, so for example, take epsilon to be equal to uh, Y minus Z over 2, for example. Okay, and because y is bigger than z, okay, I know that this is strictly positive. Uh, strictly positive. So this formula holds for every epsilon. So pick this epsilon. Right, this is one particular value for which this formula should hold. So then I know that there exists an x and s such that x is bigger than y minus uh, minus epsilon okay I use this particular epsilon so I know that x is bigger than y minus y minus z over 2 so I know that x is bigger than just make this difference which have y minus z minus minus so this is plus z over 2 okay and i know that y is bigger than z okay so this here is bigger than z plus z over 2 which is equal to z so i have that x is bigger than z however here i had that z as an upper bound okay and here I have that there's an X and S such that X is bigger than Z. So this is clearly impossible. So Z is an upper bound. So X bigger than Z and Z being an upper bound, this is a contradiction, which means that our assumption is false. So indeed, Y is the lowest upper bound that you can find. And this finishes our proof of this equivalent definition of a supremum and an infimum.
As I said, uh, the proof for the interim is very similar. You only have to change some inequalities, change upper bounds to lower bounds, and so on. So I uh, leave this as an exercise for you uh, to try at home. All right, so let's first take a small break. Hello, welcome back. Now we're going to see the second uh, result in our part on infima and supremum. And for this, we need the notion of a non-decreasing or non-increasing sequence. Okay, so remember, we have a sequence of real numbers. Okay, so we say that the sequence is non-decreasing. If we, if we look at the sequence one by one, then the numbers we get in the sequence will never go down. Okay, so xn is non-decreasing. If x1 is smaller or equal to x2, okay, x2 is smaller or equal to x3, x3 is smaller or equal to x4, and so on and so on. Okay, so Basically, for all numbers n, we have that x i x n. Sorry, let me write it without any confusion. X n is smaller or equal to x n plus one. All right, so every term is smaller or equal to the next term in the sequence. Okay, so I, I hope this notion is intuitive. And then similarly, we have that the sequence is non non increasing. If it never goes up okay so x1 is greater or equal to x2 is greater or equal to x3 is greater or equal to x4 and so on so in symbolic language for all n xn is greater or equal to xn plus one okay so we have a notion of non-decreasing and non-increasing sequence so consider the following fact. You have a sequence that's non-decreasing. Okay, so it only goes up, 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 up. And at the same time, we assume that the sequence is bounded from above. Okay, so this means that there's a number somewhere in R that's greater than any number in the sequence. So if you have a sequence that never goes down, so it can only go up, and it has an upper bound, well, I hope intuitively you see that this sequence can never escape to infinity. Right? It can never escape to infinity and it can never go down again. So it's basically sandwiched between going up or staying constant and having an upper ceiling. Okay. So for this sequence, I hope you intu intuitively uh, feel that it has to converge to something. And this is basically the result that we uh, will show now. Okay. So we have the following theorem. If xn is a, a non-decreasing sequence that is bounded from above, Okay, so I should say non-decreasing sequence in R that is bounded from above. Well, then Xn converges. Okay, so there's a limit. It goes to something in the limit. Similarly, if Xn is a non-increasing sequence in R that is bounded from below okay then again xn converges right so we have changing the inequalities and changing upper bound for, to lower bound to so have the same uh, results so again i will show the proof for non-decreasing sequence that bounded from above 
I hope you can do the same at home for the other one. It's basically changing upper bound to lower bound and changing some inequalities and you will uh, get the result. Okay, so if you look at uh, this theorem, this is an if uh, then condition. Okay, so we have to show that if x is non decreasing, sequence that is bounded from above, then there's a limit. Okay, so it's like a p implies q. Okay, so it's always good to think what's kind of the logical structure behind the theorem before you try to start attacking it uh, in the proof. Okay, so let's start with the proof. Okay, so we have to show that p implies q, so we can use the proof, we can start by p and then in the end uh, try to get a q. So we're going to uh, try to use a direct proof. Okay. And let's try to see if this works. If it doesn't work, we can still switch to uh, another kind of proof strategy and see if this works. Okay, so let's first try a direct proof. So we start with the fact that xn, xn is non-decreasing. And what do we also know? We know that xn is bounded From above. <coughs> okay. And what do we need to show? We need to show that Xn converges. Okay, so basically we need to show that Xn has a limit somewhere. Um, so let's in order to show that xn has a limit somewhere, it might be a good idea to try to guess, guess the limit, right, and then show that indeed x goes to this limit uh, if n goes uh, big. You already have shown and to some degree how to show that xn converges to some limit once we know the limit. Okay, but you still need to somehow figure out what the limit could be. So we have a sequence that's doesn't go down and is bounded from above. Okay, so from the second part that the sequence is bounded from above, right? So from this part, we know that Xn, this sequence, right? Seeing as a set of numbers, this sequence has a supremum. Okay, because any set of numbers that's bounded from above has a supremum. Okay, so from this, we know that the sequence Xn as a supreme. Okay, so let y be this supreme. So to some extent the supreme is a good candidate for the limit of the sequence, right? Because you know that the sequence can never go down, can only go up, right? And you know that the supreme is an upper bound and moreover, it's the lowest upper bound. Okay, so if it should go to an upper bound, it should go to the lowest upper bound. Okay, so in this sense, the supremum is a good candidate. So what's the strategy of the proof? Well, the strategy of the proof is to show that indeed uh, xn will converge to this uh, supremum. Okay, so if y is a supremum, what do we know? We know so things y is an upper bound and y is the lowest upper bound, but actually from the previous theorem, let me get it back, we have shown that, uh, is it this one? Nope, still another paper, right? So this was a theorem. We have shown that y is a supremum if it, if and only if it satisfies these two conditions. So instead of using the, the notion of a supremum, we can also use a and b here. Okay, so we know that this is the same as a y is an upper bound. Okay, so which basically means that for all n, x n is smaller or equal to y. Okay, and then b. Um, 
for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an x in the sequence. All right, so there exists an x in the sequence is the same as saying there exists an n of natural numbers such that y um, minus epsilon is smaller than xn. Okay. Okay, good. There exists an xn and the sequence is the same as saying that there exists an n and n because you just index x by this number. And now we have to show that xn converges. Okay. So before we continue, let's look at what we need to show. Okay. What we need to show, or what we want to show, remember we would like to show that xn converges to the supremum here. And if you take the definition of convergence, definition of xn going to y, then you have that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there should exist a big N epsilon such uh, an N, which is that for all N greater or equal to N epsilon, Xn small n minus y is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so that's the definition. That's what we need to show. And this is the two ingredients that we have that xn is smaller than y for all n, and that for all epsilon there exists an n such that y minus epsilon is smaller than xn. Okay, so we need to show this. So what do we do? We take any arbitrarily epsilon, and then we show that we can find an n that satisfies this. Okay, so take epsilon bigger than zero. So we need to show that there exists a big n such that for all n greater than big n, xn minus y is smaller than epsilon. An equivalent definition of this latter one is that y minus epsilon is smaller than x uh, n is smaller than y plus epsilon. Okay, so we take an epsilon bigger than zero and well, we have an epsilon here, so we just plug it in here. Okay, so we know that there exists an n such that y minus epsilon is smaller than xn. So we know then from B, okay, so from B, then we know that there exists an N here. So instead of small N, let me call this big N, it will become apparent uh, later on why you do this. So there exists a big N such that Y minus Epsilon is smaller than X big N, okay. And for all n and n, we know that xn is smaller than y. So what we also know, we know that from a, we know that uh, xn is smaller than y. Okay. What do we need to show? We need to show that there exists a big n epsilon, such that for all n greater or equal to this big n, this here is satisfied. So, for this big N, we can take in this N here. So if we set in E equal to N, then what do we have? We have that for all N greater or equal to N E. Well, first of all, we have that Y minus E is smaller than, minus E is smaller than X N E, right? We just, instead of N, we use N E. We also know that the sequence is non-decreasing. So we know that this is less or equal to xn because n is bigger than n epsilon. Okay. And we know that y is an upper bound. Okay, so for all n, xn is smaller than y. So we know that this is smaller uh, or equal to y and y is smaller than y plus epsilon. So we wanted to show this for all n greater or equal to n epsilon, and we have found that for all n greater or equal to n epsilon, y minus e is smaller than 
xn, right? This is smaller than this, and this is smaller than i plus e. So we are done. Okay, so this finishes the proof. So let's recapitulate, right? So we started with the fact that xn is non-decreasing and that is bounded from above, and we needed to show that xn converges. So from the fact that it's bounded from above, we found that it has a supremum. Okay, so we can take it. Once you have shown the existence of something in mathematics, you can always talk about this thing. Right, so let y be the supremum. So from the previous theorem, the definition of supremum, we know that one and a and b holds, right? So y is an upper bound. And being an upper bound means that for all elements in the sequence, it's lower equal to this y. And we know that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a number in element in sequence such that y minus epsilon is smaller than x. Okay. Then we have sh we know that we want to show that this xn converges, and we have said, okay, let's try to show that it converges to the supremum. So what does it mean to converge to the supremum y? Well, this is the definition of convergence, right? So for all epsilon there exists an n such that for all n greater than this big n, xn minus y is smaller than epsilon. So this is what we need to show for all epsilon. So we take an arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. We use b to show that we can find an n that satisfies this. Okay, this n that satisfies this, we call this big n here. So this shows that y minus epsilon is smaller than xn. And actually, we didn't need this, right? I just added it here. Maybe I needed it, but it appears not to be the case. Okay, so we needed to show for any arbitrary epsilon that this is satisfied. Here we found a big N that satisfies this. So we said, okay, let's try to put an epsilon equal to this big N here. So if small n is greater than this big N, well, first of all, we can copy this here, right? Y minus epsilon is smaller than n e. Then here we use the fact that xn is non-decreasing. Okay, this is this inequality here. So if you go further in the sequence, right, because small n is greater or equal to this big N, it can never go down. Here, for this inequality, we use the fact uh, that y is the supremum, so it's an upper bound, right? So this follows from a, y is an upper bound on the sequence, and then this is just basically an inequality because you add a non-negative epsilon bigger than zero to this, okay? So we have found an, an epsilon, right? This big n here, such that for all small n greater or equal to this n epsilon, this inequality is satisfied, and this inequality is satisfied, which is what we wanted to show uh, over here. Okay, so this finishes this proof, and it also finishes this lecture.